My heart is heavy this morning, as I'm sure yours is as well, after watching and reading about the terrible shooting at the splash pad in Rochester Hills yesterday afternoon, one in a seemingly endless series of senseless acts of violence, and one that feels so close to home, so close. Oxford High School and now Rochester Hills. At one time, maybe we could pretend that this just happened somewhere else to someone else, but now it's all too clear that this is here as well. My heart was touched also. I was talking to Jan before the service, watching and reading the stories about uh, Sandy Hook. Last week, the Sandy Hook graduation was the graduation where those children who were killed would have graduated. Those lives cut short, all that potential loss. And it just hit me so deeply. Um, and at the same time, I feel a sense of numbness. I feel a sense of despair as I think about all these random acts of violence. I was <coughs> talking to friends and, you know, there's, I feel like sometimes, what, what can I do? What can we possibly do to respond to this? There's lots of options, right? Lots of people have, have different ideas. Maybe we should all be armed all the time. We'll just all, like, I'll come to church, I'll have, you know, a, a, a gun belt on, uh, over my alb just in case, right? Or we could dig a moat around the church and we could put a uh, machine gun, turn it up on top and, you know, defend the parking lot against all invaders. Um, that's one answer. The other answer is to legislate our way out of this by increasing the number of restrictions. We've done a bunch of common sense uh, laws in Michigan, but uh, I think there's people who say, wait, we just have to keep go further and make sure there's no guns anywhere. And all of that, I think, is a human response to this human tragedy. A desire for us to somehow regain control in a world that seems out of control. As I meditated on our scriptures today in light of that tragedy, I was thinking about what they tell me. And today, the scriptures are really telling me, I don't know what they speak to you, but I, I get to share what they say to me. They're telling me that our invitation from God is to try to look at things not from a human point of view, but from God's point of view. Right? If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. St. Paul talks about this transformation that we go through. What does it mean? What does God see when God looks at this picture? And I can say one thing for sure, that God grieves with us. For whatever reason, God chooses not to intervene and solve all of these problems for us, but I do know that God weeps when we weep and God rejoices when we rejoice, that God is present in the healing hands of the medical professionals who are caring for those people who are injured, that God is there supporting and strengthening the first responders who will carry these images with them for the rest of their lives, that God is with the families who are forever changed by these injuries and this terrible violence. God is in this with us. God is in this for us. I got a word of encouragement this morning. Our Bishop Bonnie texted me and said, first of all, is everybody at St. Philip's okay? And secondly, please know that I am with you to do whatever I can to help and support you. We can be together in this. Right? With God and each other. I have friends. I have a friend, uh, Chris Yaw, the rector of St. David Southfield, and he's been finding ways to try to do something uh, to answer this. He, for years, has been doing, with the Southfield Police Department, uh, a gun buyback program. So money comes from the government, and there are all these, like, unwanted guns that are sitting around. And so he was like, what if we were a site, he said, to, to have people come and turn in their guns and then they can be destroyed. Well, it's a long story, and there are some complicated parts of that story, but I admired that, and when he asked me, do I want to be involved, I have to say that 
my first response was one of skepticism. What difference can that possibly make in a country where there are more guns than people, right? Upwards close to 400 million guns now in America. What difference would it make that a few guns that are unwanted get turned in? And I was very, I was sort of poo-pooing of his enthusiasm. And I think that was coming from a place of, of despair and cynicism, that what can we possibly do in the face of all this violence? But the scriptures have a word for me as well, uh, a very convicting word, and that is that despair for Christians is never an option. That when God looks at us, what God sees is very different from what we see. Think of the story of the prophet Samuel, who warned the people, you're not going to want a king, and then they got a king, and Saul was their king, and he was the very model of a modern king, right? He was perfect. He was tall and handsome and strong and a good warrior. He was, from central casting, the best king they could get. And so Samuel anoints Saul, and what nobody knew was that Saul was probably paranoid schizophrenic. Saul had some issues, and Saul was a terrible king. And in fact, so much so that God removed his blessing from Saul and told the prophet Samuel, I've decided that I need a new king, so I want you to go and anoint a new king. Now, Samuel is nervous. There's already a king, and that king's going to kill me if I anoint a new king. But God said, don't worry about it. Just go. Go to the family of Jesse, and there I will find you a new king. And so there goes Samuel, and he meets the family of Jesse. And the first several sons that he interviews are just like Saul. They're tall, they're strong, they're going to be great leaders. And God says, no, 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 no more sons. So Samuel says to Jesse, surely that can't be it. Is there anybody else? And Jesse says, well, there's one more kid. And he's young, and he's small, and he's, to be honest, he's not king material. So we just left him out there taking care of the sheep while we dealt with the really important stuff. And Samuel says, okay, well, call him anyway. Let's, let's at least talk to him, and here it comes. And you know the rest of the story. It's David. David, unlikely David, becomes the greatest of all the kings of Israel. David, far from perfect, as we will hear in the coming weeks in our Sunday les lessons, far from perfect and yet faithful to God, loving of God, and empowered by God to do amazing things for the work of God. It's very similar to Jesus' parable in our gospel today of the mustard seed. When God looks at the seeds, he doesn't say, wow, you know, that acorn is pretty big and strong. God says, look at the mustard seed, the tiniest, the most insignificant of all the seeds, and yet it becomes the greatest of all the shrubs. We have a God who sees beyond the outward appearance to the heart of things. A God who invites us to look not with our own eyes, of cynicism and despair, of human-centered worry, but to begin to see with the eyes of God, to look beyond the outward appearance to the heart of the matter, to see the potential in even the most insignificant things, in the most insignificant people. To me, this is a word of encouragement, because in my cynicism and despair, over these acts of violence, I miss sometimes the opportunities to do mustard seed ministry, to do little things that we may not see the benefit of, but that God sees in a whole different way. My friend Chris's uh, project for gun buyback, he's now expanding that, and so on Tuesday, despite my earlier poo-pooing of him, I'm gonna stand with him and Susan when he does a press conference to talk about this project and this ministry. I don't know if it's going to make any difference in the end. But what if, what if one gun that got turned in 
was a gun that potentially could have been taken by a mentally ill person to do a terrible act. What if this project, as small in its scope as it is, makes that kind of mustard seed difference? Yesterday, the Church of the Messiah in Detroit, one of our historically black congregations, a church that ministers especially to young black men in inner city Detroit, held uh, one of their annual marches, Silence the Violence, because the young black men of Detroit face violence every single day. Gangs and drugs and gun violence all the time. And so that church has decided to make a stand, to make a witness that they see a and yearn for a better future, God's future of peace and abundance and justice. And so, in, as an act of, of defiance and of hope, they march each year to silence the violence. Does that make any difference? From human perspective, we don't know. But from God's perspective, I think it means the world. This week I was listening to a psychologist who's the first woman tenured at Harvard in the psychology department. She's written for a long time about mindfulness, and she's done a whole bunch of studies, particularly in nursing homes. She was really interested in the mind-body connection and how our mental attitudes can actually change our physical being. And one of the experiments she did, which I found so fascinating, was with very elderly people in nursing homes, some of whom had dementia, and her theory was that one of the problems is when you go to some kinds of assisted living, you no longer have any purpose or agency. You are there to be kind of waited on until you die, right? You're just there to sit and receive, but you don't have any active participation. So I'm sure Teresa can tell me about some wonderful programs, right, that you do to engage people. But this uh, Ellen Langer, her research is that even tiny things that give people a sense of purpose and agency make a huge difference in their outcome. Studying populations of people, like a 30% increase in longevity and a great deal more of satisfaction and happiness for the end of life just by giving someone a little something to do. One of our eight o'clockers was telling me about her husband who died of Alzheimer's and as he was getting up there, now this was a little risky, I thought, but she had him sitting at the kitchen and slicing with a sharp knife uh, green beans. I thought, well, that's very brave of you, but, but he, he could still do that. He could, he could slice the green beans. He could participate in making the meal, which he had loved to do with her for years. He was still able to do it in a little way, and it made all the difference in his mental outlook and in his physical being. And I think this is a lesson for, for me and for us. We can't change all of the problems. We can't fix all the problems in the world, right? The world is a dangerous and a scary place. You can't even go with your kids to a splash pad without the risk of something horrific happening. And yet, we have power more than we know to make a difference, to do small things mustard seed things that can make a tremendous difference in the long run. We must not, and this is a word for myself, we must not become despairing and give up hope. We must find ways to make positive impact wherever and however we can. One of the other things that Ellen Langer talks about is being more present and aware of the people around us. I was thinking about that man who shot those kids and people at the splash pad and then went home and took his own life. Probably he lived with his mother. Who knows what his life was like, what kind of damage he had gone through. But what if somebody had been able to really see him and to make a slight impact on his life? What if he had been embraced by a Bible study or a coffee group or a men's group? What if he had been invited to change his course in a tiny way? We don't know the impact that one small act of kindness on our part can have on the whole trajectory of a person's life. 
I encourage us, I encourage myself to have mustard seed faith, to have that transforming uh, vision that St. Paul talks about, to see not with the human eyes of despair and negativity, but with God's eyes of hope and purpose and meaning and faith. What can we do? What can I do to make a tiny difference in another person's life and by doing so, maybe change the world? Amen.